Section 21 of Folklore and Legends Oriental. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Folklore and Legends Oriental by Charles John Tibbets. The Man Who Never Laughed. There was a man of those possessed of houses and riches, who had wealth and servants and slaves and other possessions, and he departed from the world to receive the mercy of God, whose name be exalted, leaving a young son. And when the son grew up, he took to eating and drinking, and hearing of instruments of music and songs, and was liberal and gave gifts, and expended the riches that his father had left to him, until all the wealth had gone. He then betook himself to the sale of the male black slaves, and the female slaves, and other possessions, and expended all that he had of his father's wealth and other things, and became so poor that he worked with the laborers. In this state he remained for a period of years. While he was sitting one day beneath a wall, waiting to see who would hire him, lo, a man of comely countenance and apparel drew near him and saluted him. So the youth said to him, O oh, uncle, hast thou known me before now? The man answered, I have not known thee, O oh, my son, at all, but I see the traces of affluence upon thee, though thou art in this condition. The young man replied, O oh, uncle, what fate and destiny have ordained hath come to pass. But hast thou, O oh, uncle, O oh, comely faced, any business in which to employ me? the man said to him o oh, my son i desire to employ thee in an easy business the youth asked and what is it o oh, uncle and the man answered him i have with me ten shakes in one abode and we have no one to perform our wants thou shalt receive from us of food and clothing what will suffice thee and shalt serve us and thou shalt receive of us thy portion of benefits and money Perhaps also God will restore to thee thine affluence by our means. The youth replied, I hear and obey. The sheikh then said to him, I have a condition to impose upon thee. And what is thy condition, O uncle? asked the youth. He answered him, O oh, my son, it is that thou keep our secret with respect to the things that thou shalt see us do and when thou seest us weep that thou askest not respecting the cause of our weeping and the young man replied well o uncle so the sheikh said to him o my son come with us relying on the blessing of god whose name be exalted and the young man followed the sheikh until the latter conducted him to the bath after which he sent a man who brought him a comely garment of linen and he clad him in it and went with him to his abode and his associates and when the young man entered he found it to be a high mansion with lofty angles ample with chambers facing one another and saloons and in each saloon was a fountain of water and birds were warbling over it and there were windows overlooking on every side a beautiful garden within the mansion the sheikh conducted him into one of the chambers and he found it decorated with colored marbles and its ceiling ornamented with blue and brilliant gold and it was spread with carpets of silk and he found in it ten sheikhs sitting facing one another wearing the garments of mourning weeping and wailing so the young man wondered at their case and was about to question the sheikh who had brought him but he remembered the condition and therefore withheld his tongue then the sheikh committed to the young man a chest containing thirty thousand pieces of gold saying to him o oh, my son expend upon us out of this chest and upon thyself according to what is just and be thou faithful and take care of that wherewith i have entrusted thee and the young man replied i hear and obey he continued to expend upon them for a period of days and nights after which one of them died whereupon his companions took him and washed him and shrouded him and buried him in the garden behind the mansion and death ceased not to take of them one after another 
until there remained only the sheikh who had hired the young man so he remained with the young man in that mansion and there was not with them a third and they remained thus for a period of years then the sheikh fell sick and when the young man despaired of his life he addressed him with courtesy and was grieved for him and said to him o oh, uncle i have served you and not failed in your service one hour for a period of twelve years but have acted faithfully to you and served you according to my power and ability the sheikh replied yes o oh my son thou hast served us until these sheikhs have been taken unto god to whom be ascribed might and glory and we must inevitably die the young man said o oh, my master thou art in a state of peril and i desire thee that thou inform me what hath been the cause of your weeping and the continuance of your wailing and your mourning and your sorrow he replied o oh, my son thou hast no concern with that and require me not to do what i am unable for i have begged god whose name be exalted not to afflict any one with my affliction now if thou desire to be safe from that into which we have fallen open not that door and he pointed to it with his hand and cautioned him against it and if thou desire that what hath befallen us should befall thee open it and thou wilt know the cause of which thou hast beheld in our conduct but thou wilt repent when repentance will not avail thee then the illness increased upon the sheikh and he died and the young man washed him with his own hands and shrouded him and buried him by his companions he remained in that place possessing it and all the treasure but notwithstanding this he was uneasy reflecting upon the conduct of the sheikhs and while he was meditating one day upon the words of the sheikh and his charge to him not to open the door it occurred to his mind that he might look at it so he went in that direction and searched until he saw an elegant door over which the spider had woven its webs and upon it were four locks of steel when he beheld it he remembered how the sheikh had cautioned him and he departed from it his soul desired him to open the door and he restrained it during a period of seven days but on the eighth day his soul overcame him and he said i must open that door and see what will happen to me in consequence for nothing will repel what god whose name be exalted decreeth and predestineth and no event will happen but by his will accordingly he arose and opened the door after he had broken the locks and when he had opened the door he saw a narrow passage along which he walked for the space of three hours and lo he came forth upon the bank of a great river at this the young man wondered and he walked along the bank looking to the right and left and behold a great eagle descended from the sky and taking up the young man with its talons it flew with him between heaven and earth until it conveyed him to an island in the midst of the sea there it threw him down and departed from him so the young man was perplexed at his case not knowing whither to go but while he was sitting one day lo the sail of a vessel appeared to him upon the sea like the star in the sky wherefore the heart of the young man became intent upon the vessel in the hope that his escape might be effected in it he continued looking at it until it came near unto him and when it arrived he beheld a bark of ivory and ebony the oars of which were of sandalwood and aloes wood and the whole of it was encased with plates of brilliant gold there were also in it ten damsels virgins like moons when the damsels saw him they landed to him from the bark and kissed his hands saying to him thou art the king the bridegroom then there advanced to him a damsel who was like the shining sun in the clear sky having in her hand a kerchief of silk in which were a royal robe and a crown of gold set with varieties of jacinths having advanced to him she clad him and crowned him after which the damsel carried him in their arms 
to the bark and he found in it varieties of carpets of silk and diverse colors they then spread the sails and proceeded over the depths of the sea now when i proceeded with them says the young man i felt sure that this was a dream i knew not whither they were going with me and when they came in sight of the land i beheld it filled with troops the number of which none knew but god whose perfection be extolled and whose name be exalted clad in colts of mail they brought forward to me five marked horses with saddles of gold set with varieties of pearls and precious stones and i took a horse from among these and mounted it the four others proceeded with me and when i mounted the ensigns and banners were set over my head the drums and the cymbals were beaten and the troops disposed themselves in two divisions right and left i wavered in opinion as to whether i were asleep or awake and ceased not to advance not believing in the reality of my stately procession but imagining that it was the result of confused dreams until we came in sight of a verdant meadow in which were palaces and gardens and trees and rivers and flowers and birds proclaiming the perfection of god the one the omnipotent and now there came forth an army from among those palaces and gardens like the torrent when it poureth down until it filled the meadow when the troops drew near to me they hailed and lo a king advanced from among them riding alone preceded by some of his chief officers walking the king on approaching the young man alighted from his courser and the young man seeing him do so alighted also and they saluted each other with the most courteous salutation then they mounted their horses again and the king said to the young man accompany us for thou art my guest so the young man proceeded with him and they conversed together while the stately trains in orderly disposition went on before them to the palace of the king where they alighted and all of them entered together with the king and the young man the young man's hand being in the hand of the king who thereupon seated him on the throne of gold and seated himself beside him when the king removed the lithum from his face lo this supposed king was a damsel like the shining sun in the clear sky a lady of beauty and loveliness and elegance and perfection and conceit and amorous dissimulation the young man beheld vast affluence and great prosperity and wondered at the beauty and loveliness of the damsel then the damsel said to him know o king that i am the queen of this land and all these troops that thou hast seen including every one whether of cavalry or infantry are women they are not among them any men the men among us in this land till and sow and reap employing themselves in the cultivation of the land and the building and repairing of the towns and in attending to the affairs of the people by the pursuit of every kind of art and trade but as to the women they are the governors and magistrates and soldiers and the young man wondered at this extremely and while they were thus conversing the vizier entered and lo she was a grey-haired old woman having a numerous retinue of venerable and dignified appearance and the queen said to her bring to us the cadi and the witnesses so the old woman went for that purpose and the queen turned towards the young man conversing with him and cheering him and dispelling his fear by kind words and addressing him courteously she said to him art thou content for me to be thy wife and thereupon he rose and kissed the ground before her but she forbade him and he replied o oh, my mistress i am less than the servants who serve thee she then said to him seest thou not these servants and soldiers and wealth and treasures and hordes he answered her yes and she said to him all these are at thy disposal thou shalt make use of them and give and bestow as seemeth fit to thee then she pointed to a closed door and said to him all these things thou shalt dispose of but this door thou shalt not open for if thou open it thou wilt repent when repentance will not avail thee 
her words were not ended when the vizier with kadi and the witnesses entered and all of them were old women with their hair spreading over their shoulders and a venerable and dignified appearance when they came before the queen she ordered them to perform the ceremony of the marriage contract so they married her to the young man and she prepared the banquets and collected the troops and when they had eaten and drunk the young man took her as his wife and he resided with her seven years passing the most delightful comfortable and agreeable life but he meditated one day upon opening the door and said were it not that there are within it great treasures better than what i have seen she had not prohibited me from opening it then he arose and opened the door and lo within it was the bird that had carried him from the shore of the great river and deposited him upon the island when the bird beheld him it said to him no welcome to a face that will never be happy so when he saw it and heard its words he fled from it but it followed him and carried him off and flew with him between heaven and earth for the space of an hour and at length deposited him in the place from which it had carried him away after which it disappeared he thereupon sat in that place and returning to his reason he reflected upon what he had seen of affluence and glory and honour and of the riding of the troops before him and commanding and forbidding and he wept and wailed he remained upon the shore of the great river where that bird had put him for the space of two months wishing that he might return to his wife but while he was one night awake mourning and meditating someone spoke and he heard his voice but saw not his person calling out how great were the delights far far from thee is the return of what is past and how many therefore will be the sighs so when the young man heard it he despaired of meeting again that queen and the return to him of the affluence in which he had been living he then entered the mansion where the sheikhs had resided and knew that they had experienced the like of that which had happened unto him and that this was the cause of their weeping and their mourning wherefore he excused them grief and anxiety came upon the young man and he entered his chamber and ceased not to weep and moan relinquishing food and drink and pleasant scents and laughter until he died and was buried by the side of the sheikhs End of section 21section twenty two of folklore and legends oriental this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by annie hill folklore and legends oriental by charles john tibbets section twenty two the fox and the wolf a fox and a wolf inhabited the same den resorting thither together and thus they remained a long time but the wolf oppressed the fox and it so happened that the fox counselled the wolf to assume benignity and to abandon wickedness saying to him if thou persevere in thine arrogance probably god will give power over thee to a son of adam for he is possessed of stratagems and artifice and guile he captureth the birds from the sky and the fish from the sea and cutteth the mountains and transporteth them and all this he accomplisheth through his stratagems betake thyself therefore to the practice of equity and relinquish evil and oppression for it will be more pleasant to thy taste the wolf however received not his advice on the contrary he returned him a rough reply saying to him thou hast no right to speak on matters of magnitude and importance he then gave the fox such a blow that he fell down senseless and when he recovered he smiled in the wolf's face apologizing for his shameful words and recited these two verses if i have been faulty in my affection for you and committed a deed of shameful nature i repent of my offence 
and your clemency will extend to the evildoer who craveth forgiveness so the wolf accepted his apology and ceased from ill-treating him but said to him speak not of that which concerneth thee not lest thou hear that which will not please thee the fox replied i hear and obey i will abstain from that which pleaseth thee not for the sage hath said offer not information on a subject respecting which thou art not questioned and reply not to words when thou art not invited leave what concerneth thee not to attend to that which doth concern thee and lavish not advice upon the evil for they will recompense thee for it with evil when the wolf heard these words of the fox he smiled in his face but he meditated upon employing some artifice against him and said i must strive to effect the destruction of this fox as to the fox however he bore patiently the injurious conduct of the wolf saying within himself verily insolence and calumny occasion destruction and betray one into perplexity for it hath been said he who is insolent suffereth injury and he who is ignorant repenteth and he who feareth is safe moderation is one of the qualities of the noble and good manners are the noblest gain it is advisable to behave with dissimulation towards this tyrant and he will inevitably be overthrown as to the fox however he bore patiently the injurious conduct of the wolf saying within himself verily insolence and calumny occasion destruction and betray one into perplexity for it hath been said he who is insolent suffereth injury and he who is ignorant repenteth and he who feareth is safe moderation is one of the qualities of the noble and good manners are the noblest gain it is advisable to behave with dissimulation towards this tyrant and he will inevitably be overthrown then he said to the wolf verily the lord pardoneth and becometh propitious unto his servant when he hath sinned and i am a weak slave and have committed a transgression in offering thee advice had i foreknown the pain that i have suffered from thy blow i had known that the elephant could not withstand nor endure it but i will not complain of the pain of that blow on account of the happiness that hath resulted unto me from it for if it had a severe effect upon me its result was happiness and the sage hath said the beating inflicted by the preceptor is at first extremely grievous but in the end it's sweeter than clarified honey so the wolf said i forgive thine offence and cancel thy fault but beware of my power and confess thyself my slave for thou hast experienced my severity unto him who showeth me hostility the fox therefore prostrated himself before him saying to him may god prolong thy life and mayest thou not cease to subdue him who opposeth thee and he continued to fear the wolf and to dissemble towards him after this the fox went one day to a vineyard and saw in its walls a breach but he suspected it saying unto himself there must be some cause for this breach and it hath been said whoso seeth a hole in the ground and doth not shun it and be cautious of advancing to it boldly exposeth himself to danger and destruction it is well known that some men make a figure of the fox in the vineyard and even put before it grapes in plates in order that the fox may see it and advance to it and fall into destruction verily i regard this breach as a snare and it hath been said caution is the half of cleverness caution requireth me to examine this breach and to see if i can find there anything that may lead to perdition covetousness doth not induce me to throw myself into destruction he then approached it and going round about examining it warily beheld it and lo there was a deep pit which the owner of the vineyard had dug to catch in it the wild beasts that despoiled the vines 
and he observed over it a slight covering. So he drew back from it and said, Praise be to God that I regarded it with caution. I hope that my enemy, the wolf, who hath made my life miserable, may fall into it, so that I alone may enjoy absolute power over the vineyard and live in it securely. Then, shaking his head and uttering a loud laugh, he merrily sang these verses. Would that I be held at the present moment in this well a wolf, who hath long afflicted my heart, and made me drink bitterness perforce. Would that my life might be spared, and that the wolf might meet his death. Then the vineyard would be free from his presence, and I should find in it my spoil. Having finished his song, he hurried away until he came to the wolf, when he said to him, Verily God hath smoothed for thee the way to the vineyard without fatigue. This hath happened through my good fortune. Mayest thou enjoy, therefore, that to which God hath granted thee access, in smoothing thy way to that plunder, and that abundant sustenance without any difficulty. So the wolf said to the fox, what is the proof of that which thou hast declared? The fox answered, I went to the vineyard, and found that its owner had died, and I entered the garden, and beheld the fruits shining upon the trees. So the wolf doubted not the words of the fox, and in his eagerness he arose and went to the breach. His cupidity had deceived him with vain hopes, and the fox stopped and fell down behind him as one dead, applying this verse as a proverb suited to the case. Dost thou covet an interview with Layla? It is covetousness that causeth the loss of men's heads. When the wolf came to the breach, the fox said to him, Enter the vineyard, for thou art spared the trouble of breaking down the wall of the garden, and it remaineth for God to complete the benefit. So the wolf walked forward, desiring to enter the vineyard, and when he came to the middle of the covering of the hole, he fell into it, whereupon the fox was violently excited by happiness and joy. His anxiety and grief ceased, and in merry tones he sang these verses. Fortune hath compassionated my case, and felt pity for the length of my torment, and granted me what I desired and remove that which I dreaded. I will therefore forgive its offences committed in former times, even the injustice it hath shown in the turning of my hair grey. There is no escape for the wolf from utter annihilation, and the vineyard is for me alone, and I have no stupid partner. He then looked into the pit, and beheld the wolf weeping in his repentance and sorrow for himself, and the fox wept with him so the wolf raised his head towards him and said is it from thy compassion for me that thou hast wept o abu la hossein no answered the fox by him who cast thee into this pit but i weep for the length of thy past life and in my regret at thy not having fallen into this pit before the present day hadst thou fallen into it before i met with thee I had experienced refreshment and ease, but thou hast been spared to the expiration of thy decreed term and known period. The wolf, however, said to him, Go, O evildoer, to my mother, and acquaint her with that which hath happened to me. Perhaps she will contrive some means of my deliverance. But the fox replied, The excess of thy covetousness and eager desire has entrapped thee into destruction since thou hast fallen into a pit from which thou wilt never be saved. Knowest thou not, O ignorant wolf, that the author of the proverb saith, He who thinks not of results will not be secure from perils. O Abu la Hossein, rejoined the wolf, thou hast wont to manifest an affection for me, and to desire my friendship, and fear the greatness of my power. Be not then rancorous towards me for that which I have done unto thee, for he who hath won in his power, and yet forgiveth, will receive a recompense from God. And the poet hath said, So good, even on an unworthy soil, 
for it will not be fruitless wherever it is sown verily good though it remain long buried none will reap but him who sowed it o oh, most ignorant of the beasts of prey said the fox and most stupid of the wild beasts of the regions of the earth hast thou forgotten thy haughtiness and insolence and pride and thy disregarding the rights of companionship and thy refusing to be advised by the saying of the poet tyrannize not if thou hast the power to do so for the tyrannical is in the danger of revenge thine eye will sleep while the oppressed wakeful will call down curses on thee and god's eye sleepeth not o abu el hossein exclaimed the wolf be not angry with me for my former offences for forgiveness is required of the generous and kind conduct is among the best means of enriching oneself how excellent is the saying of the poet haste to do good when thou art able for at every season thou hast not the power he continued to abase himself to the fox and said to him perhaps thou canst find some means of delivering me from destruction but the fox replied o oh, artful guileful treacherous wolf hope not for deliverance for this is the recompense of thy base conduct and a just retaliation then shaking his jaws with laughing he recited these two verses no longer attempt to beguile me for thou wilt not attain thy object what thou seekest from me is impossible thou hast sown and reap then vexation o oh, gentle one among the beasts of prey resumed the wolf thou art in my estimation more faithful than to leave me in this pit he then shed tears and repeated this couplet o thou whose favours to me have been many and whose gifts have been more than can be numbered no misfortune hath ever yet befallen me but i have found thee ready to aid me in it the fox replied o oh, stupid enemy how art thou reduced to humility submissiveness abjectness and obsequiousness after thy disdain pride tyranny and haughtiness i kept company with thee through fear of thine oppression and flattered thee without a hope of conciliating thy kindness but now terror hath affected thee and punishment hath overtaken thee and he recited these two verses o thou who seekest to beguile thou hast fallen in thy base intention taste then the pain of shameful calamity and be with other wolves cut off the wolf still entreated him saying o oh, gentle one speak not with the tongue of enmity nor look with its eye but fulfil the covenant of fellowship with me before the time for discovering a remedy shall have passed arise and procure for me a rope and tie one end of it to a tree and let down to me its other end that i may lay hold of it perhaps i may so escape from my present predicament and i will give thee all the treasures that i possess the fox however replied thou hast prolonged a conversation that will not procure thy liberation hope not therefore for thy escape through my means but reflect upon thy former wicked conduct and the perfidy and artifice which thou thoughtest to employ against me and how near thou art to being stoned know that thy soul is about to quit the world and to perish and depart from it then wilt thou be reduced to destruction and an evil abode is it to which thou goest o oh, abu el hasin rejoined the wolf be ready in returning to friendship and be not so rancorous know that he who delivereth a soul from destruction hath saved it alive and he who saveth a soul alive is as if he had saved the lives of all mankind follow not a course of evil for the wise abhor it and there is no evil more manifest than my being in this pit drinking the suffocating pains of death and looking upon destruction when thou art able to deliver me from the misery into which i have fallen but the fox exclaimed 
oh thou barbarous hard-hearted wretch i compare thee with respect to the fairness of thy professions and the baseness of thine intention to the falcon with the partridge and what asked the wolf is the story of the falcon and the partridge the fox answered i entered a vineyard one day to eat of its grapes and while i was there i beheld a falcon pounce upon a partridge but when he had captured him the partridge escaped from him and entered his nest and concealed himself in it whereupon the falcon followed him calling out to him o oh, idiot i saw thee in the desert hungry and feeling compassion for thee i gathered for thee some grain and took hold of thee that thou mightest eat but thou fleddest from me and i see no reason for thy flight unless it be to mortify show thyself then and take the grain that i have brought thee and eat it and may it be light and wholesome to thee so when the partridge heard these words of the falcon he believed him and came forth to him and the falcon stuck his talons into him and got possession of him the partridge therefore said to him is this that of which thou saidest that thou hadst brought for me from the desert and of which thou saidest to me eat it and may it be light and wholesome to thee thou hast lied unto me and may god make that which thou eatest of my flesh to be a mortal poison in thy stomach and when he had eaten it his feathers fell off and his strength failed and he forthwith died the fox then continued know o wolf that he who diggeth a pit for his brother soon falleth into it himself and thou behavedst with perfidy to me first cease replied the wolf from addressing me with this discourse and propounding fables and mention not unto me my former base actions it is enough for me to be in this miserable state since i have fallen into a calamity for which the enemy would pity me much more than the true friend consider some stratagem by means of which i may save myself and so assist me if the doing this occasion thee trouble thou knowest that the true friend endureth for his own true friend the severest labour and will suffer destruction in obtaining his deliverance and it hath been said an affectionate friend is even better than a brother if thou procure means for my escape i will collect for thee such things as shall be a store for thee against the time of want and then i will teach the extraordinary stratagems by which thou shalt make the plenteous vineyards accessible and shall strip the fruitful trees so be happy and cheerful but the fox said laughing as he spoke how excellent is that which the learned have said of him who is excessively ignorant like thee and what have the learned said asked the wolf the fox answered the learned have observed that the rude in body and in disposition is far from intelligence and nigh unto ignorance for thine assertion o perfidious idiot that the true friend undergoeth trouble for the deliverance of his own true friend is just as thou hast said but acquaint me with thine ignorance and thy paucity of sense how should i bear sincere friendship towards thee with thy treachery hast thou considered me a true friend unto thee when i am an enemy who rejoiceth in thy misfortune these words are more severe than the piercing of arrows if thou understand and as to thy saying that thou wilt give me such things as will be a store for me against the time of want and will teach me stratagems by which i shall obtain access to the plenteous vineyards and strip the fruitful trees how is it o guileful traitor that thou knowest not a stratagem by means of which to save thyself from destruction how far then art thou from profiting thyself and how far am i from receiving thine advice if thou know of stratagems employ them to save thyself from this predicament from which i pray god to make thine escape far distant see then o idiot if thou know any stratagem and save thyself by its means from slaughter before thou lavish instruction upon another 
but thou art like a man whom a disease attacked and to whom there came a man suffering from the same disease to cure him saying to him say shall i cure thee of thy disease the first man therefore said to the other why hast thou not begun by curing thyself so he left him and went his way and thou o wolf art in the same case remain then in thy place and endure that which hath befallen thee now when the wolf heard these words of the fox he knew that he had no kindly feeling for him so he wept for himself and said i have been careless of myself but if god deliver me from this affliction i will assuredly repent of my overbearing conduct unto him that is weaker than i and i will certainly wear wool and ascend the mountains commemorating the praises of god whose name be exalted and fearing his punishment and i will separate myself from all the other wild beasts and verily i will feed the warriors in defence of the religion and the poor then he wept and lamented and thereupon the heart of the fox was moved with tenderness for him on hearing his humble expressions and the words which indicated his repenting of arrogance and pride he was affected with compassion for him and leaping with joy placed himself at the brink of the pit and sat upon his hind legs and hung down his tail into the cavity upon this the wolf arose and stretched forth his paw towards the fox's tail and pulled him down to him so the fox was with him in the pit the wolf then said to him, O oh, fox of little compassion, wherefore didst thou rejoice in my misfortune? Now thou hast become my companion, and in my power thou hast fallen into the pit with me, and punishment hath quickly overtaken thee. The sages have said, If any one of you reproach his brother for deriving his nourishment from miserable means, he shall experience the same necessity and how excellent is the saying of the poet when fortune throweth itself heavily upon some and encampeth by the side of others say to those who rejoice over us awake the rejoicers over us shall suffer as we have done i must now he continued hasten thy slaughter before thou beholdest mine so the fox said within himself i have fallen into the snare with this tyrant and my present case requireth the employment of artifice and frauds it hath been said that the woman maketh her ornaments for the day of festivity and in a proverb i have not reserved thee o my tear but for the time of my difficulty and if i employ not some stratagem in the affair of this tyrannical wild beast i perish inevitably how good is the saying of the poet support thyself by guile for thou livest in an age whose sons are like the lions of the forest and brandish around the spear of artifice that the mill of subsistence may revolve and pluck the fruits or if they be beyond thy reach then content thyself with herbage he then said to the wolf hasten not to kill me lest thou repent o courageous wild beast endowed with might and excessive fortitude if thou delay and consider what i am about to tell thee thou wilt know the desire that i formed and if thou hasten to kill me there will be no profit to thee in thy doing so but we shall die here together so the wolf said o thou wily deceiver how is it that thou hopest to effect my safety and thine own that thou askest me to give thee a delay acquaint me with the desire that thou formedest the fox replied as to the desire that i formed it was such as requireth thee to recompense me for it well since when i heard thy promises and thy confession of thy past conduct and thy regret at not having before repented and done good and when i heard thy vows to abstain from injurious conduct to thy companions and others and to relinquish the eating of the grapes and all other fruits 
and to impose upon thyself the obligation of humility and to clip thy claws and break thy dog teeth and to wear wool and offer sacrifice to god whose name be exalted if he delivered thee from thy present state i was affected with compassion for thee though i was before longing for thy destruction so when i heard thy profession of repentance and what thou vowedst to do if god delivered thee i felt constrained to save thee from thy present predicament i therefore hung down my tail that thou mightest catch hold of it and make thine escape but thou wouldst not relinquish thy habit of severity and violence nor desire escape and safety for thyself by gentleness on the contrary thou didst pull me in such a way that i thought my soul had departed so i became a companion with thee of the abode of destruction and death and nothing will effect the escape of myself and thee but one plan if thou approve of this plan that i have to propose we shall both save ourselves and after that it will be incumbent on thee to fulfil that which thou hast vowed to do and i will be thy companion so the wolf said and what is thy proposal that i am to accept the fox answered that thou raise thyself upright then i will place myself upon thy head that i may approach the surface of the earth and when i am upon its surface i will go forth and bring thee something of which to take hold of and after that thou wilt deliver thyself but the wolf replied i put no confidence in thy words for the sages have said he who confideth when he should hate is in error and it hath been said he who confideth in the faithless is deceived and he who maketh trial of the trier will repent how excellent also is the saying of the poet let not your opinion be otherwise than evil for ill opinion is among the strongest of intellectual qualities nothing casteth a man into a place of danger like the practice of good and a fair opinion and the saying of another always hold an evil opinion and so be safe whoso liveth vigilantly his calamities will be few meet the enemy with a smiling and open face but raise for him an army in the heart to combat him and that of another the most bitter of thine enemies is the nearest whom thou trustest in beware then of men and associate with them willily thy favourable opinion of fortune is a weakness think evil of it therefore and regard it with apprehension verily rejoined the fox an evil opinion is not commendable in every case but a fair opinion is among the characteristics of excellence and its result is escape from terrors it is befitting o wolf that thou employ some stratagem for thine escape from the present predicament and it will be better for us both to escape than to die relinquish therefore thine evil opinion and thy malevolence for if thou think favourably of me i shall not fail to do one of two things either i shall bring thee something of which to lay hold and thou wilt escape from thy present situation or i shall act perfidiously towards thee and save myself and leave thee but this is a thing that cannot be for i am not secured from meeting with some such affliction as that which thou hast met with and that would be the punishment of perfidy it hath been said in a proverb fidelity is good and perfidy is base it is fit then that thou trust in me for i have not been ignorant of misfortunes delay not therefore to contrive our escape for the affair is too straight for thee to prolong thy discourse upon it the wolf then said verily notwithstanding my little confidence in thy fidelity i knew what was in thy heart that thou desirest my deliverance when thou wast convinced of my repentance and i said within myself if he be veracious in that which he asserteth he hath made amends for his wickedness and if he be false he will be recompensed by his lord 
so now i accept thy proposal to me and if thou act perfidiously toward me thy perfidy will be the means of thy destruction then the wolf raised himself upright in the pit and took the fox upon his shoulders so that his head reached the surface of the ground the fox thereupon sprang from the wolf's shoulders and found himself upon the face of the earth when he fell down senseless the wolf now said to him o oh, my friend forget not my case nor delay my deliverance the fox however uttered a loud laugh and replied o oh, thou deceived it was nothing but my jesting with thee and deriding thee that entrapped me into thy power for when i heard thy profession of repentance joy excited me and i was moved with delight and danced and my tail hung down into the pit so thou didst pull me and i fell by thee then god whose name be exalted delivered me from thy hand wherefore then should i not aid in thy destruction when thou art of the associates of the devil know that i dreamed yesterday that i was dancing at thy wedding and i related the dream to an interpreter who said to me thou wilt fall into a frightful danger and escape from it so i knew that my falling into thy power and my escape was the interpretation of my dream thou too knowest o oh deceived idiot that i am thine enemy how then dost thou hope with thy little sense and thine ignorance that i will deliver thee when thou hast heard what rude language i used and how shall i endeavour to deliver thee when the learned have said that by the death of the sinner are produced ease to mankind and purgation of the earth did i not fear that i should suffer by fidelity to thee such affliction as would be greater than that which may result from perfidy i would consider upon means for thy deliverance so when the wolf heard the words of the fox he bit his paw in repentance he then spoke softly to him but obtained nothing thereby with a low voice he said to him verily you tribe of foxes are the sweetest of people in tongue and the most pleasant in jesting and this is jesting in thee but every time is not convenient for sport and joking oh idiot replied the fox jesting hath a limit which its employer transgresseth not think not that god will give thee possession of me after he hath delivered me from thy power the wolf then said to him thou art one in whom it's proper to desire my liberation on account of the former brotherhood and friendship that subsisted between us and if thou deliver me i will certainly recompense thee well but the fox replied the sages have said take not as thy brother the ignorant and wicked for he will disgrace thee and not honour thee and take not as thy brother the liar for if good proceed from thee he will hide it and if evil proceed from thee he will publish it and the sages have said for everything there is a stratagem excepting death and everything may be rectified excepting the corruption of the very essence and everything may be repelled excepting destiny and as to the recompense which thou assertest that i deserve of thee i compare thee in thy recompensing to the serpent fleeing from the havi when a man saw her in a state of terror and said to her what is the matter with thee o serpent she answered i have fled from the havi for he seeketh me and if thou deliver me from him and conceal me with thee i will recompense thee well and do thee every kindness so the man took her to obtain the reward and eager for the recompense and put her into his pocket and when the howie had passed and gone his way and what she feared had quitted her the man said to her where is the recompense for i have saved thee from that which thou fearedst and didst dread the serpent answered him tell me in what member i shall bite thee for thou knowest that we exceed not this recompense she then inflicted upon him a bite from which he died and thee o oh idiot continued the fox i compare to that serpent with that man hast thou not heard the saying of the poet 
trust not a person in whose heart thou hast made anger to dwell nor think his anger hath ceased verily the vipers though smooth to the touch show graceful motions and hide mortal poison o oh, eloquent and comely-faced animal rejoined the wolf be not ignorant of my condition and of the fear with which mankind regard me thou knowest that i assault the strong places and strip the vines do therefore what i have commanded thee and attend to me as the slave attendeth to his master o oh, ignorant idiot who seekest what is vain exclaimed the fox verily i wonder at thy stupidity and at the roughness of thy manner in thine ordering me to serve thee and to stand before thee as though i were a slave but thou shalt soon see what will befall thee by the splitting of thy head with stones and the breaking of thy treacherous dog teeth the fox then stationed himself upon a mound overlooking the vineyard and cried out incessantly to the people of the vineyard until they perceived him and came quickly to him he remained steady before them until they drew near unto him and unto the pit in which was the wolf and then he fled so the owners of the vineyard looked into the pit and when they beheld the wolf in it they instantly pelted him with heavy stones and continued throwing stones and pieces of wood upon him and piercing him with the points of spears until they killed him when they departed then the fox returned to the pit and standing over the place of the wolf's slaughter saw him dead whereupon he shook his head in the excess of his joy and recited these verses fate removed the wolf's soul and it was snatched away far distant from happiness be his soul that hath perished how long hast thou striven abos tirhan to destroy me but now have burning calamities befallen thee thou hast fallen into a pit in which none shall descend without finding it in the blasts of death after this the fox remained in the vineyard alone and in security fearing no mischief end of section twenty two Section 23 of Folklore and Legends Oriental. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Folklore and Legends Oriental by Charles John Tibbets. The Shepherd and the Jogi. It is related that during the reign of the king of Kutch, named Lake, a jogi lived, who was a wise man, and wonderfully skilled in the preparation of herbs. For years he had been occupied in searching for a peculiar kind of grass, the roots of which should be burnt, and a man be thrown into the flames. The body so burnt would become gold, and any of the members might be removed without the body, sustaining any loss as the part so taken would always be self-restored. It so occurred that this jogi, whilst following a flock of goats, observed one amongst them eating the grass he was so anxious to procure. He immediately rooted it up, and desired the shepherd who was near to assist him in procuring firewood. When he had collected the wood and kindled a flame into which the grass was thrown, the jogi, wishing to render the shepherd the victim of his avarice, desired him, under some pretense, to make a few circuits round the fire. The man, however, suspecting foul play, watched his opportunity, and seizing the jogi himself, he threw him into the fire and let him be consumed. Next day, on returning to the spot, great was his surprise to behold the golden figure of a man lying amongst the embers. He immediately chopped off one of the limbs and hid it. The next day he returned to take another when his astonishment was yet greater to see that a fresh limb had replaced the one already taken in short the shepherd soon became wealthy and revealed the secret of his riches to the king lake who by the same means accumulated so much gold that every day he was in the habit of giving one lakh and twenty five thousand rupees in alms to fakirs end of section twenty three
Section 24 of Folklore and Legends Oriental. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Folklore and Legends Oriental by Charles John Tibbets. The Perfidious Vizier. A king of former times had an only son whom he had contracted in marriage to the daughter of another king. But the damsel, who was endowed with great beauty, had a cousin who had sought her in marriage, and had been rejected. Wherefore he sent great presents to the vizier of the king just mentioned, requesting him to employ some stratagem by which to destroy his master's son, and to induce him to relinquish the damsel. The vizier consented, then the father of the damsel sent to the king's son, invited him to come and introduce himself to his daughter, to take her as his wife, and the father of the young man sent him with the treacherous vizier, attended by a thousand horsemen, and provided with rich presents. When they were proceeding over the desert, the vizier remembered that there was near unto them a spring of water called ez Sarah, and that whoever drank of it, if he were a man, became a woman. He therefore ordered the troops to alight near it, and introduced the prince to go thither with them. When they arrived at the spring, the king's son dismounted from his courser, and washed his hands and drank. And lo, he became a woman, whereupon he cried out and wept until he fainted. The vizier asked him what had befallen him, so the young man informed him. And on hearing his words, the vizier affected to be grieved for him, and wept. The king's son then sent the vizier back to his father to inform him of this event, determining not to proceed nor to return until his affliction should be removed from him or until he should die. He remained by the fountain during a period of three days and nights, neither eating nor drinking, and on the fourth night there came to him a horseman with a crown upon his head, appearing like one of the sons of the king's. This horseman said to him, Who brought you, O young man, unto this place? So the young man told him his story. And when the horseman heard it, he pitied him and said to him, The vizier of thy father is the person who hath thrown thee into this calamity. For no one of mankind knoweth of this spring excepting one man. Then the horseman ordered him to mount with him. He therefore mounted, and the horseman said to him, Come with me to my abode, for thou art my guest this night. The man replied, Inform me who thou art before I go with thee. And the horseman said, I am the son of a king of the jinn, and thou art son of a king of mankind. And now be of good heart and cheerful eye on account of that which shall dispel thine anxiety and thy grief for it is unto me easy. So the young man proceeded with him from the commencement of the day, forsaking his troops and soldiers, whom the vizier had left at their halting place, and ceased not to travel on with his conductor until midnight, when the son of the king of Jinn said to him, Knowest thou what space we have traversed during this period? The young man answered him, I know not. The son of the king of the Jinn said, we have traversed space of a year's journey to him who travelleth with diligence. So the young man wondered thereat, and asked, How shall I return to my family? The other answered, This is not thine affair. It is my affair, and when thou shalt have recovered from thy misfortune, thou shalt return to thy family in less time than the twinkling of an eye for to accomplish that will be to me easy. The young man, on hearing these words from the genie, almost flew with excessive delight. He thought that the event was a result of confused dreams, and said, Extolled be the perfection of him who is able to restore the wretched and render him prosperous. They ceased not to proceed until morning, when they arrived at a verdant bright land, with tall trees and warbling birds, and gardens of surpassing beauty, and fair palaces, 
and thereupon the son of the king of the jinn alighted from his courser commanding the young man also to dismount he therefore dismounted and the jinnee took him by the hand and they entered into one of the palaces where the young man beheld an exalted king and a sultan of great dignity and he remained with them that day eating and drinking until the approach of night then the son of the king of the jinn arose and mounted with him and they went forth and proceeded during the night with diligence until morning and lo they came to a black land not inhabited abounding with black rocks and stones as though it were a part of hell whereupon the son of the king of men said to the jinnee what is the name of this land and he answered it is called the dusky land and belongeth to one of the kings of the jinn whose name is sulu jenahien none of the kings can attack him nor doth any one enter his territory unless by his permission so stop in thy place while i ask his permission accordingly the young man stopped and the jinn was absent from him for a while and then returned to him and they ceased not to proceed until they came to a spring flowing from black mountains the jinni said to the young man alight he therefore alighted from his courser and the jinni said to him drink of this spring the young prince drank of it and immediately became again a man as he was at first by the power of god whose name be exalted whereat he rejoiced with great joy not to be exceeded and he said to the jinn ho oh, my brother what is the name of this spring the jinnee answered it is called the spring of the women no woman drinketh of it but she becometh a man therefore praise god and thank him for thy restoration and mount thy courser so the king's son prostrated himself thanking god whose name be exalted then he mounted and they journeyed with diligence during the rest of the day until they had returned to the land of the jinni and the young man passed the night in his abode in the most comfortable manner after which they ate and drank until the next night when the son of the king of the jinn said to him dost thou desire to return to thy family this night the young man answered yes so the son of the king of the jinn called one of his father's slaves whose name was rajis and said to him take this young man hence and carry him upon thy shoulders and let not the dawn overtake him before he is with his father-in-law and his wife the slave replied i hear and obey and with feelings of love and honour will do it then the slave absented himself for a while and approached in the form of an effet and when the young man saw him his reason fled and he was stupefied but the son of the king of the jinn said to him no harm shall befall thee mount thy courser ascend upon his shoulders the young man then mounted upon the slave's shoulders and the son of the king of the jinn said to him close thine eyes so he closed his eyes and the slave flew with him between heaven and earth and ceased not to fly along with him while the young man was unconscious and the last third of the night came not before he was on the top of the palace of his father-in-law then the ifrit said to him alight he therefore alighted and the ifrit said to him open thine eyes for this is the place of thy father-in-law and his daughter then he left him and departed and as soon as the day shone and the alarm of the young man subsided he descended from the roof of the palace and when his father-in-law beheld him he rose to him and met him wondering at seeing him descend from the top of the palace and said to him we see other men come through the doors but thou comest down from the sky the young man replied what god whose perfection be extolled and whose name be exalted desired hath happened and when the sun rose his father-in-law ordered his vizier to prepare great banquets and the wedding was celebrated the young man remained there two months and then departed with his wife to the city of his father but as to the cousin of the damsel 
he perished by reason of his jealousy and envy. End of section 24 End of Folklore and Legends Oriental by Charles John Tibbets